Thank you, David, for coming on. This is our, our Polsky Advances uh, in Urologic Oncology. It's a real pleasure of mine to introduce you. You've been a friend and mentor for, for decades now. Um, and so we're really lucky to have you here tonight uh, and, and presenting and talking about your research. I, I can still remember the first time I met you at, at MD Anderson and like you were really kind of the, the hope that I had to go there, you know, and it was really great to be, kind of follow your career and everything you've developed. But I, looking at your bio sketch now, uh, I really contribute most of your work related to tumor subtyping, and that's like the fourth or fifth part of the science, which really kind of talks about the breadth of what you've been able to achieve. So you're the director of the Ladder Institute. And again, just really, I consider like the forethought of right now for, for bladder cancer. So thank you so much for for being here and talking today. I'm really looking forward to your talk on neoadjuvant uh, markers. Yeah, Josh, you know, again, it's great working together with you. Uh, Northwestern is super lucky to have you. Uh, if you ever feel like going somewhere else, give us a call. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Josh, uh, is very familiar with the content of uh, my talk today. Uh, it's a bit of a, a tour through molecular subtypes uh, and uh, DNA damage response mutations and uh, kind of the way we weave through uh, our understanding that they were associated with clinical benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And now I would say we're at a point where we're reevaluating some of our original conclusions, which is always what happens. So I don't have any disclosures right now. Um, as most of you, maybe all of you know, um, urinary bladder cancer is very common in men. It's less common in women. About uh, three quarters to four fifths of cases happen in men. Um, and the key clinical uh, distinction uh, associated with prognosis is whether or not tumors are invading muscularis. Um, we divide them into non-muscle invasive, uh, including CIS, TA, and T1, although there are certainly significant uh, uh, differences among those three uh, stages. And then T2 through T4, and again, uh, very distinct differences in clinical management among uh, patients with T2 tumors versus T3 and T4. So not to oversimplify this, but for the rest of the talk today, that's going to be the distinction, whether the, uh, the uh, tumor that's left behind after neoadjuvant chemotherapy is non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive. Another distinction that actually Bogdan Cherniak, who's a close friend of mine at MD Anderson, a uh, very expert geopathologist, worked on the TCGA project, has emphasized that uh, I think uh, I have come to uh, more strongly believe in is that there may be two tracks of bladder carcinogenesis. One associated uh, with this so-called papillary pathway that's most often uh, hallmarked by activating FGF receptor 3 mutations. And another one uh, that is more closely associated with carcinoma in situ and probably loss of tumor suppressors, including P53 and RB, among others. And these two pathways really almost uh, from a molecular standpoint look like a completely distinct entities, although sometimes the papillary pathway can uh, cross over and uh, at the molecular level look more like uh, tumors that uh, progress along this non-papillary pathway. So the origin of bladder cancer still remains a subject of debate. Um, the structure of the urothelium is outlined here in a very simplistic manner. Of course, down here we have the lamina propria and deeper in the muscularis. We have up here with the bladder lumen, we have this lining of umbrella cells and have very tight connection mediated junctions that prevent uh, perfusion of urine across this uh, cell layer. And then there's an intermediate cell layer uh, that uh, seems to be uh, able to form umbrella cells in response to injury, and a basal layer that's characterized by the expression of keratins, high molecular weight keratins, CD44, and some other molecules. Uh, lineage tracing studies in mouse models 
have suggested that cancers uh, tend to arise in this basal layer, although uh, we really don't know for sure what happens in humans. So uh, we've come a long way since about 2011, which is when we really started this work. Um, at the time, um, we had a pretty good clinical understanding of these distinctions between papillary and non-papillary and some of the major uh, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that are disrupted in the urothelium to promote cancer. Uh, we knew that uh, bladder cancers were associated with cigarette smoking, but we didn't know a lot else about bladder cancers. It was really the introduction of whole transcriptome mRNA expression profiling and DNA sequencing, um, exome sequencing, that uh, has provided us with a much more granular description of heterogeneity. Uh, this is an evolving process, of course, and whereas the work that I'm going to really emphasize today was done with bulk RNA and DNA sequencing, Josh is heavily involved in uh, newer technologies involving spatial profiling, and uh, a lot of folks are doing single-cell uh, mRNA uh, sequencing to look at uh, heterogeneity in deeper detail at the single-cell and, and regional level. And these studies are telling us that there's incredible plasticity and in intratumoral heterogeneity uh, that can be revealed by these technologies that we didn't appreciate at the time uh, most of the work I'm going to discuss with you today was performed. So I think our, our understanding of cancer is evolving, and I think the name of the game these days is plasticity. And finally, another thing that's transforming our field uh, is the introduction of liquid biopsies. So uh, blood liquid biopsies, usually done with plasma, uh, have taught us a lot about the DNA mutations and other alterations that probably are associated with more advanced disease. Uh, and in addition, in urothelial cancers, we also have direct access to the luminal side of these tumors through the urine. And so there's some very exciting technologies being developed uh, to look at uh, tumor DNA alterations in urine. I think having these two liquid biopsy approaches available, along with a more granular understanding of, of uh, heterogeneity from spatial and single cell approaches, will provide us with a new generation of biomarkers that uh, we can apply to these uh, same questions in the future. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about a single clinical trial that uh, we ran through the Southwest Oncology Group's GU, GU committee. Josh is uh, co-chair for uh, bladder cancer translational medicine on that committee and is an incredible colleague to work with. Uh, this started again back in the early uh, 2010s uh, with a question that uh, came up uh, as a consequence of an earlier clinical trial that was performed in the same committee called SWOG 8710. This was a clinical trial that randomized patients to e either receive upfront radical cystectomy or MVAC prior to radical cystectomy. And the clinical trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was uh, a, a very important practice-changing clinical trial, or should have been practice-changing. Uh, downstaging, which means that you start out with a muscle invasive tumor and you, at cystectomy, find that you have either no disease, which is PAT T0, or no muscle invasive disease, which is uh, less than PT2. Uh, patients who achieved either of those outcomes had excellent outcomes, uh, disease-specific and overall survival. Uh, the, the clinical trial, therefore, demonstrated a clear benefit uh, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There was more downstaging uh, with chemotherapy. About 38% 30 per, of patients received, uh, achieved downstaging, whereas only about 12 to 15% uh, with surgery alone. So there was a clear survival benefit established. Uh, however, urologists and others uh, looked at these data and wondered uh, whether the benefit was clinically significant enough in unselected patients to warrant exposing everybody to cytotoxic chemotherapy. So uh, it didn't matter uh, whether you were downstage with surgery alone or with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery. Either way, uh, 
uh, survival was exceptional, not perfect, which is important, uh, but patients who were not downstaged uh, had uh, poor outcomes, whether they received new adjuvant chemotherapy or not. So this established the principle of using downstaging uh, to uh, predict outcomes years afterward. And uh, there was a push uh, to use downstaging as a, a means of fast tracking uh, agents that, uh, with, with unknown mechanisms of action and clinical activities, uh, fast tracking them for uh, FDA approval. I think the lobby is still going on for that. But here's kind of the overall survival benefit difference. And as you can see, uh, cystectomy alone versus MVACT and cystectomy, the P values here in a you know, large clinical trial are, are pretty modest. Uh, this, I don't think, uh, convinced a lot of urologists that neoadjuvant chemotherapy was really uh, worth it in terms of the overall impact on survival. And so therefore, until very recently, really under the leadership of some contemporaries of ours in SWOG, have uh, rates of utilization of neoadjuvant chemotherapy risen to the point where uh, at least half, if not more, patients at most academic institutions who are eligible for cisplatin uh, receive it. So we held a workshop to try to figure out how to exploit this neoadjuvant platform, uh, what we would do to fast track uh, discoveries by uh, coupling biomarker studies to downstaging. And uh, this was uh, the first clinical trials planning meeting for urothelial cancers that was run by NCI. And uh, Dan Theaterescue and I were in charge of the session focused on biomarkers. And Dan had developed an algorithm that he called Coxin, whereby he took the National Cancer Institute's panel of 60 cell lines. Now, these cell lines are not all bladder cancer cell lines. They're a mixture. Um, and the information that the NCI had already generated on their sensitivities to uh, various uh, conventional and investigational agents. And then by using gene expression data from the cell lines, identified uh, profiles of sensitivity and resistance to each agent, and then uh, filtered out the gene expression patterns that were present in both the cell lines and in primary tumors that have been subjected to whole transcriptome mRNA expression profiling. And using bioinformatics created a gene expression model that weighted certain factors more greatly than others, and then applied that model to different subsets of human tumors and demonstrated uh, that they could separate survival outcomes pretty effectively in these retrospective studies based on Coxon's score. So we thought the, the idea was to uh, do a prospective study to attempt to validate this discovery of Dan Theater Rescues. So uh, the clinical trial schema that we came up with uh, is shown here. This is the SWOG S1314 trial. Patients would uh, be uh, staged with TRBT. Uh, the biopsies had to meet certain size criteria to make sure we would get enough RNA out of them for gene expression profiling. Um, the tissues were uh, subjected to mRNA expression profiling using an Affymetrix direct hybridization platform. Patients were then randomized to receive either gemcitabine plus, gem, plus cisplatin, which is one of the two major platinum-based regimens that we, used in, uh, we use in bladder cancer patients, or a modified uh, MVAC regimen, dose-dense MVAC or accelerated MVAC that was deemed to be a bit uh, uh, more easy to give and perhaps a bit more active by some of our colleagues. And then uh, we would, uh, at cystectomy, determine whether patients were downstaged and uh, apply the coxin algorithm to the pretreatment tissues and attempt to correlate the coxin results with outcomes. So that was the primary objective of the clinical trial. We'll get back to the results in a minute. So in the background, in the same time, uh, work that was initiated by two groups in Scandinavia, one in Denmark and one in uh, Sweden, uh, we're employing gene expression data to uh, assign tumors to molecular subtypes. 
they were inspired to do this work by similar work that had been conducted by various investigators at uh, the Broad and also by Chuck Peru's group at University of North Carolina in hemologic malignancies and breast cancer, respectively. And you're probably all familiar with the results of the Peru work. Um, so in this uh, pioneering study in the year 2000, the Peru group published uh, that breast cancers could be grouped into molecular subtypes. They called them intrinsic molecular subtypes uh, that they uh, saw resembled either the basal layer of the mammary epithelium or the luminal layer of the mammary epithelium or were enriched with uh, HER2 gene expression and other genes associated with that. And these um, molecular subtypes became really household names in the field of breast cancer. Uh, the basal-like tumors in breast cancer were aggressive and corresponded largely to triple negative cancers identified by other methods. Uh, they were short, associated with short disease-specific and overall survival, advanced stage and metastatic disease, et cetera in the absence of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, on the other hand, patients with luminal A and a little bit lesser extent luminal B tumors um, didn't seem to benefit that much from perioperative chemotherapy, but they did benefit uh, from hormonal therapy, um, unlike the basal-like tumors, which don't. So uh, this was one example among many of the papers uh, describing these differences in outcomes based on molecular subtype and uh, what you see is the more aggressive basal tumors were associated with uh, much better uh, increased clinical benefit uh, from chemotherapy uh, when patients received a pathologic CR. So uh, this was going on very, very uh, uh, in parallel work in the background as uh, uh, the Scandinavian groups and others began to assign tumors from bladder cancer patients to molecular subtypes. So Lars Deerscott, who is still very active in our field, along with Torbjörn Orntoft, uh, published really the first uh, work on this. And using partial transcriptome profiling and unsupervised clustering methods, they essentially stratified their tumors into uh, papillary and non-papillary, or I should say PTA and T1 through T3. So more or less... Um, correlating with clinical features of these tumors. And then a subsequent study done by um, Matthias Herglund's group, again, uh, he, his team is still very active in this field, did a very similar approach combining both uh, whole transcriptome gene expression uh, with uh, limited uh, mutational profiling, and uh, their conclusions were very similar, that they could separate uh, tumors by unsupervised methods very easily into uh, clinically relevant uh, categories, but at this level, uh, really not revealing much more about tumor heterogeneity beyond what could be seen clinically. But they went on to create a larger data set of both non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancers. And using whole transcriptome profiling, they started to see more complexity. Um, they grouped their tumors essentially into five major subtypes. Uh, these subtypes are still familiar to us today and still being studied uh, within the context of various clinical trials. Importantly, essentially all of the non-Muslim invasive cancers uh, were assigned to a subtype that they called urobasal A. Uh, now it's often referred to as urothelial A. Uh, whereas there were four other subtypes that were uh, present in muscle invasive cancers. Uh, these subtypes included one that's called genomically unstable, another one that seems to be heavily infiltrated with fibroblasts and immune cells, and then two uh, other subtypes, one called SCC-like that uh, looked a lot like squamous cell carcinomas uh, of the head, neck, and lung. So in parallel, we were, uh, as part of the TCJ and also just as our, our own group at MD Anderson, uh, involved in uh, studies to do relatively similar things. Uh, we decided instead to focus on just muscle invasive cancers. Uh, I guess the rationale at the time was that they're more aggressive, more clinically meaningful, and 
we imagine that by assembling larger cohorts of muscle invasive cancers, we would find more granularity than if we had a mixed cohort of both non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive tumors. And essentially what we decided uh, in all of these studies, and we were in close communication because the UNC group and the MD Anderson group were all, both part of the TCGA group, was that uh, what we were seeing resembled uh, the lung group's findings, but also the molecular subtypes of breast cancer that Chuck Brew's group had identified previously. So these papers were all published back to back, essentially in, in uh, 2014. Our own work, we used Illumina direct hybridization gene expression profiling on flash frozen muscle invasive tumors. Uh, we concluded there were three clusters in our data set. One of them, this red cluster, was associated with more aggressive disease. And we then developed some methods to do um, RNA expression profiling in formalin fixed paraffin embedded uh, tissues. Interestingly, this was done in collaboration with the same group we're working with at Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, in Ohio as part of the Southwest Oncology Group. Uh, this was done with Dazzle, which is a platform that's no longer available. But it was a very robust platform, and uh, we were able to essentially reproduce what we'd seen in our flash frozen tumors using these uh, FFPE tumors. Uh, these are all, again, archival tumors from MD Anderson. And then Woon Young Choi also downloaded a data set that was publicly available from a group in Korea and saw the same pattern. So this cluster one was associated with more aggressive disease. When we looked at the top genes in this cluster, we found keratin-14, 5-6, um, CD44. A lot of the same genes that Chuck Peru had discovered were associated with basal-like breast cancers. On the other hand, the cluster 2 and 3 uh, overlapped a bit in terms of the expression of these genes down here, some of which keratin-20, PPAR gamma, FOXA1, uh, correlated with the luminal genes that the Chuck Peru group had discovered in breast cancer. Interestingly, the top genes in this cluster two were all associated with cancer-associated fibroblasts or smooth muscle cells. So these genes, uh, the top genes in this cluster were really not expressed by the cancer as far as we could tell, but rather by infiltrating stromal cells. So we did gene, gene set enrichment to prove to ourselves that breast cancer basal markers were enriched in these cluster one tumors and breast cancer luminal markers were enriched in this, uh, uh, these other two clusters. In parallel, the TCGA concluded there were four subtypes in their uh, flash frozen RNA-seq data from 128 tumors. And again, some of the same patterns. So they found uh, basal genes in uh, two of the clusters and luminal genes in the other two clusters. Uh, they went on further to show that uh, these uh, tumors with the basal genes in them tended to have squamous features, um, whereas the tumors over here in this first cluster had papillary histopathologic characteristics. So overall, um, the patterns that we saw in bladder cancers, uh, at the highest level, tumors could be separated into basal and luminal categories. And then we had this other subtype that at the time we called P53-like, but now might be more appropriately termed luminal infiltrated, uh, that was associated with lower cell cycle gene expression and uh, overall quiescence. Uh, these tumors uh, corresponded to cluster two in the TCGA. This turned into a different uh, name, uh, luminal infiltrated in a subsequent version of the TCGA classifier. And you could find features, uh, very similar features in the molecular subtypes of breast cancer. The Lund group took our results and demonstrated that indeed what we had found was very consistent with what they had already published. So. There was good consensus about the biologic features of these molecular subtypes, and uh, these subtypes are all arrived at completely independently. So, uh, Bogdan Cherniak and our group decided that uh, probably doing RNA sequencing on clinical materials was impractical, so he uh, developed uh, an immunist chemical approach that's reasonably accurate. Um, probably that the core of the immunist chemical uh, methods for detecting subtypes are uh, 
GATA3 or FOXA1 and uh, high molecular weight keratins. Probably keratin-14 is, is the best. Uh, these aren't really being implemented as much as they should be. Um, Josh uh, made me aware of a presentation that was just given, uh, I guess, last week at ESMO, where a group in, in uh, Pasteur Curry uh, uh, in Paris used immunochemistry on tumors to show that many of the tumors that they profiled in their clinical trial could be uh, assigned to different subtypes using a similar approach. So the TCGA uh, expanded the, their cohort to over 400 tumors and repeated their analyses and concluded that they could find subtypes, five subtypes, uh, there was another luminal subtype identified, a new neuronal or neuroendocrine subtype, which is very interesting. I'm not going to talk much about it today. Uh, they removed the clod and low tumors. And um, as a consequence of this work, uh, we decided to have a consensus meeting in Madrid in 2015, uh, led by Paco Real and Francois Radvani. He's the one at Curie that... Uh, I was just mentioning previously. And uh, the results of that meeting uh, were a project to essentially do cross-platform cross comparisons of all the different uh, classifiers that were available. And uh, we reached consensus on five subtypes. Um, the luminal papillary tumors uh, really corresponded to cluster one in the original TCGA classification and retain the name from the subsequent TCGA project. There are a couple of uh, lum additional luminal subtypes, one of which corresponds pretty well with the Lund genomically stable, unstable subtype I mentioned previously. There's the stromal-rich subtype that corresponds to uh, our P53-like tumors or uh, the Lund group's infiltrated tumors pretty well. And then there's the basal squamous subtype that uh, contains the clod and low tumors that were identified as cluster four previously, uh, and then this new neuroendocrine subtype, which actually uh, is associated with the shortest disease-specific survival and is the smallest of the subtypes in conventional urothelial carcinoma data sets. So the TCGA group uh, proposed that perhaps subtypes could be used to direct therapeutic decision-making. Um, in terms of neuronal versus neuroendocrine, um, if a patient presents with neuroendocrine or small cell bladder cancer, he or she is receiving a toposide platinum-based therapy already. So this uh, idea that you can, might extend this to tumors that uh, are a gene expression twins of these small cell or neuroendocrine tumors makes sense. Uh, for basal squamous, uh, there was a recognition that they have high immune infiltrates. So uh, probably the juiciest target in the basal squamous tumors are immune cells. Uh, luminal papillary tumors are enriched with activating FGF receptor 3 mutations and fusions. And so uh, the most attractive target in luminal papillary tumors is FGF receptor 3. And we have good clinical inhibitors of FGF receptor 3, now both non-selective and selective that are available for, uh, for clinical interrogation. As far as these other uh, subtypes are concerned, still a mystery what to do with them. The luminal infiltrated tumors uh, uh, correspond somewhat well with uh, uh, other features that have been identified that are associated with uh, resistance to immunotherapy. And so I would say it's a bit controversial what to do with uh, luminal infiltrated tumors. Um, the, the idea that maybe we could target the fibroblasts themselves to augment some of the uh, other things that we're trying to do to them is very attractive to me. So what about basal tumors? Again, just like their breast cancer counterparts, they were associated with advanced stage and metastatic disease of presentation. Interestingly, they're more prevalent in women. We still don't know why. They seem to be, at the, uh, with preliminary data, more prevalent in African Americans, although uh, the data sets are very small. And they are often enriched with squamous uh, features, as we showed you earlier, and also sarcomatoid variant histology. <clears throat> 
luminal tumors uh, correspond to the Euro A subtype from Lund. They resent, represent the vast majority of non-muscle invasive bladder cancers. I would say Josh can, can comment on this, but probably high-grade T1 tumors are uh, the only subset of uh, non-muscle invasive tumors that we've profiled so far that seem to contain more complexity. Um, they're enriched with papillary, micropapillary, and sometimes plasmacytoid variants. And uh, the luminal papillary tumors in particular are highly enriched with activating FGFR3 alterations. So what about the molecular subtypes in NAC? So uh, we had patients who'd been treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy as part of our data set. And what we discovered was that the tumors that were assigned to this P53-like infiltrated subtype were more resistant to neoadjuvant chemotherapy than basal or luminal tumors were. And then parallel work that was led by Peter Black uh, with collaborative help from uh, Genome DX, then Decipher, now Verisite, um, did similar analyses and concluded not that the P53 like tumors were resistant, but that basal squamous tumors uh, were associated with the most clinical benefit. So uh, in our data set, we looked at downstaging as a function of subtype. Basal tumors and luminal tumors were indistinguishable in terms of their rates of downstaging. So oftentimes, uh, people at meetings will discuss the fact that basal tumors seem to be more sensitive. Uh, in our hands, they never were. Uh, instead, uh, I'll show you later, they seem to be associated with better survival outcomes in a couple of our cohorts. Um, what was also interesting, though, is where we had a tissue from before and after, uh, we saw that a lot of the tumors that were uh, luminal before chemotherapy uh, ended up being assigned to the P53-like tumor uh, subtype afterward. So we wondered just how stable the subtypes were, and we'll get back to that later, but also maybe more importantly, whether Delivery of neoadjuvant chemotherapy may have consequences for drug resistance uh, subsequent to that. We did another phase two clinical trial, this one with Dosta and Sembac plus Bevacizumab. And again, there was really no difference in downstaging with, with basal aluminal. And in fact, we even mostly lost the difference that we saw with the P53 like tumors. Uh, but instead, uh, patients with the basal cancers had much better survival outcomes than we expected. People with uh, P53-like tumors still had uh, worse outcomes. <clears throat> so we validated this um, in an expanded neoadjuvant chemotherapy cohort. Uh, Woon Young Choi in our group is still expanding this using neoadjuvant chemotherapy treated patients from Hopkins and elsewhere. And Still, in these expanded cohorts, we saw these similar trends where with chemotherapy, basal tumors had this big survival difference. Um, P53-like, if anything, in some cohorts looked like they did worse. And luminal tumors, we didn't really see much uh, clinical benefit in terms of survival. And likewise, in other cohorts, very similar patterns. Um, it's, it's hard to match clinical variables on patients who do or do not get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For, so, so multivariable analyses uh, oftentimes reveal problems with the interpretation of these results. So in uh, Peter Black's study, a um, very large study conducted with sites across North America and Europe, they concluded something similar to what we had seen, which was that Without neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you can see that basal and clod and low tumors are associated with worse survival outcomes. Uh, in their hands, their luminal infiltrated tumors were intermediate and the luminal papillary were the uh, best. Uh, however, in the presence of NAC, the basal tumors in particular move up to become a uh, good prognosis uh, along with luminal papillary. Uh, if anything, the P53-like or luminal infiltrated tumors seem to uh, do worse. Another thing that we noticed in our data set was that within basal tumors, separating responders and non-responders, we saw these genes. And uh, looking at them carefully, we recognized that they were really associated with uh, activated cytotoxic T cells for the most part, some B cells in here too. 
And if you look at these genes, they're really uh, very strongly enriched in the responders in this cohort. So with all this by way of background and with RNA expression data generated because of the Coxon project, uh, we decided to leverage these data and look at the association between molecular subtypes and outcomes in S1314, the Coxon trial. Uh, there were other things done. We still have microRNA expression data from this trial that's, that are being analyzed. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about the DNA mutation data. Uh, Peter O'Donnell, the University of Ch uh, Chicago, is doing uh, SNPs to look at possible uh, relationships between polymorphisms and drug metabolism enzymes and clinical outcomes. So the response rates in each arm of the trial, remember it was gemcitabine, platinum, uh, and dose-dense MBAC, uh, were very similar. Uh, complete response rates, uh, partial response rates, uh, this would be downstaging to less than or equal to T1. Uh, so if you combine both of them, about half or a little more of our patients uh, were uh, downstaged. The Primary analysis was the Coxon algorithm, and um, Kathy Tangen in our group uh, looked at the Coxon scores for either gemcitabine cisplatin or dose-dense MVAC. There were separate gene expression classifiers for each, and unfortunately, the dose-dense MVAC classifier did, did not uh, segregate tumors to statistical significance. But the gemcitabine cisplatin classifier, uh, especially in the combined data set with um, uh, uh, downstaging to less than or equal to PT1, uh, did achieve statistical significance. So uh, if the classifier is primarily driven by platinum, uh, this would be considered a success. So Woon Young used the F metrics data from this trial to assign tumors to subtypes, and we saw the expected ratios of uh, basal, B53-like, and luminal. I would say that um, some of the uh, markers that we were used to seeing were uh, a little bit less differentially expressed in the subtypes than we were used to. We think that's probably the platform. And uh, Woon Young's working with a, a bioinformatician uh, colleague of hers named Sun Chin Kim to uh, try to redevelop a more uh, robust gene expression based classifier for these subtypes uh, that's more uh, trained on apometrics data. But the, unfortunately, when we looked at either the pooled data in both arms or by treatment arm, there was no effect of uh, molecular subtype associated with downstaging. So um, giving you some background first about uh, parallel work that was going on looking at DNA. So uh, RNA has been used extensively uh, to try to assign uh, patients to different prognostic categories, uh, certainly since oncotype DX and other platforms have been developed and still being used today. But uh, RNA expression, by definition, um, is potentially plastic because uh, it's not driven by things that are hardwired into the tumor. Whereas DNA alterations, specifically those that drive cancer progression, would be expected to be more hardwired into tumors. And so it made good sense to determine, to, to look to see whether DNA-based alterations might be more stably associated with uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy outcomes. So two groups really pioneered this work. The first was led by Ellie Van Allen at the Broad and Jonathan Rosenberg, starting at Dana-Farber, and then later when he joined Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they really both looked, uh, both projects looked at extreme responders. So in uh, the... Uh, Rosenberg Van Allen study, they compared 25 complete responders to 25 non responders. And then uh, the Fox Chase study, led by Betsy Plimack, uh, they did a very similar thing with tumors from her dose dense MVAC clinical trial that we leveraged, in fact, for the MD Anderson work that I shared with you previously. 
So the results of both studies linked inactivating DDR mutations, DNA damage and repair mutations, with response and, and survival outcomes, but they identified different genes. So in the case of the Ellie Van Allen, Jonathan Rosenberg paper, they identified somatic ERCC2 mutations, inactivating mutations. Uh, the group subsequently went on uh, under uh, the supervision guidance effort of Kent Mao and Gopa Ayer and others to actually prove in preclinical models that the mutations they identified were associated with chemo resistance. And Betsy Plumack's group uh, found three genes that they linked to uh, sensitivity, namely RB1, ATM, and FANC-C, part of the Fancomian Fanc anemia pathway. So same concept, different genes. So looking at survival outcomes and combined data sets, um, you can see that uh, with inactivating ERCC2 mutations, uh, the benefit uh, is really pronounced. Uh, essentially, nobody who had an ERCC2 mutation uh, died in this Fox Chase cohort and uh, was also very uh, tightly associated with survival in the, in the original uh, discovery cohort. Likewise, uh, having any one of these three mutations uh, was associated with exceptional survival outcomes in two different uh, cohorts from Fox Chase. So uh, these studies actually led to the development of uh, clinical trials designed to determine whether uh, presence of one of these mutations could be used to um, allow patients uh, organ preservation. So in this one, uh, led at Fox Chase by Betsy Plymack and Dan Guinesman, uh, they used uh, sequencing of TRBT material looking for these four genes um, to, uh, along with clinical staging, uh, identify patients who could uh, undergo active surveillance in spite of having been diagnosed with muscle invasive cancer. Um, they also uh, offered patients who still had residual disease um, bladder preservation in the form of BCG or chemo RT because, again, downstaging to non muscle invasive disease has been associated with excellent outcomes. Uh, for muscle invasive disease, um, they were offered chemotherapy plus radio chemo radiation if they had clinical T2. Uh, but if they had clinical three, T3 or above, they were offered cystectomy. And so we actually, under Josh's direction, are doing a clinical trial of uh, chemo radiation with and without immunotherapy, uh, where we're pushing uh, to enroll patients with T3 and T4 tumors uh, because there is this uh, concern about using bladder pressure preservation on patients with more advanced disease. So uh, both Betsy and Jonathan um, did independent projects looking at DNA uh, damage and repair mutations using two independent platforms. Uh, it'll be interesting. We're going to share the comparisons of those results at some point uh, in the future. Uh, one of the projects, though, was funded through the NCI's BIQ program, and that was the one that was led by Jonathan Rosenberg and GOPA where they used a Memorial Sloan Kettering's MSK impact platform to sequence their tumors. Uh, we actually isolated the DNA uh, for them in parallel with the RNA uh, at MD Anderson. And uh, that RNA from, from 13, 14 is still available for future studies at the bank. So the primary objective uh, was to associate uh, deleterious alterations in what turned out to be a panel of nine DNA damage repair genes with downstaging. And then the secondary objectives had to do with uh, associating with those uh, DNA damage repair mutations with survival. Uh, and then whether there were uh, different uh, differences uh, associated with treatment on. And they used uh, what mo I'm sure all of you are familiar with, MSK Impact. It's a, a large gene panel 
uh, informed by parallel germ germline DNA sequencing um, and the association uh, between MSK impact DDR uh, mutation calls and pathologic downstaging was evaluated. So, uh, Kathy Tang at the at the Swab Stat Center did all the clinical outcomes correlations, and so the, the investigators at Memorial Sloan Kettering were blinded to the results. So, in looking at uh, the characteristics of the 1314 cohort, uh, the uh, frequency of D DNA damage and repair gene alterations was consistent with what we've seen before. Specifically, ERCC2 is mutated in something like 14 to 18 percent of tumors, and uh, ATM uh, is, is mutated at a similar frequency. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are also mutated in bladder cancers, and there's uh, good evidence now that um, about 14 or 15 percent of patients have uh, germline defects, pathogenic or likely pathogenic uh, mutations in DNA damage and repair genes that are probably associated with hereditary uh, predisposition. So um, the primary objective was met in both studies. So sharing the ERCC2 results with you here. So both in terms of uh, complete response, um, ERCC2 or NA deleterious alteration, both were associated uh, significantly with, with response. Also associated with response, just looking at less than PT2. Uh, however, um, survival outcomes weren't statistically significant. So here's an example of the survival outcomes. So this progression-free survival and overall survival looking at um, all of the DDR genes together, and you can see that it's pushing significance, but not quite there. And looking at ERCC2 itself, you can see, um, again, there seems to be a trend there, but uh, this study was not powered well enough to see statistical significance. So um, this um, is a partial success, I would say, just like the uh, uh, Coxon study was a partial success. Maybe this was a bit better news. So overall conclusions from all of this work, um, in the validation, prospective validation definitive study that we performed in Swag's Coxon trial, the work that we had done retrospectively was not confirmed. And there are several different reasons for why this might have been the case. Uh, one that's being explored right now is potentially the use of different gene expression platforms. Um, I think this is part of the answer. And another one was that the 1314 clinical trial was a lower risk cohort than the ones that we used in our retrospective studies. So uh, at MD Anderson, we tended to only treat patients with high risk features lymphovascular invasion, hydronephrosis, and some other characteristics uh, routinely with, chemo, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy if they had clinical T, if T2, whereas uh, coxin was really uh, enriched for T2 tumors in, in, in contrast. And, and also uh, Betsy Plumac's cohort also was higher risk cohort than 1314. But I think maybe one major uh, component of this, and it's being confirmed, I think, uh, with ongoing studies, is plasticity. So, as I mentioned, uh, you, we already had seen that luminal tumors could switch subtype. Uh, this, though, was based on infiltration levels with cancer-associated fibroblasts, and so it's maybe not so surprising that a, an inflammation-causing chemotherapy regimen might recruit fibroblasts in the tumor. More importantly, we also developed a uh, basal versus luminal subtype classifier of our own. Uh, it's different from the base 47 model that Billy Kim developed because it really focuses on basal squamous tumors versus others. And uh, you can see the gene expression profiles here. When we applied that basal luminal subtype classifier to uh, primary tumors and lymph node metastases, and this is something that the Lund group has also seen, we saw that a very significant fraction of them switched from basal to luminal. And uh, likewise, when we uh, looked at 
biopsies and cystectomies from patients before and after chemotherapy, a handful of them also switched. Uh, in addition, work that uh, Michael Shen's group at Columbia has pioneered, we're collaborating with them on, a, on, on more uh, detailed mechanistic insights into this right now. Uh, what they did was they created uh, patient-derived organoids uh, from patients with bladder cancer. And what was interesting, if you look over here in panel E from their paper, is that if you look at the primary tumor, it could be assigned to either basal, luminal, or mixed. And um, what often happened in these organoids was that with passage, they became more basal in blue here. So uh, this phenomenon, which uh, we've seen as well with our organoids, and we've also seen that with uh, organoids derived from mouse urothelium, uh, has been termed basal basalization by Philip Beachy's group at Stanford, and is a clear indication that um, basal and luminal identities are plastic and can be modified by culture ex vivo and also by a number of other things that uh, a lot of people are studying right now. So the DDR mutations also weren't as tightly associated with response as uh, we had hoped they would be. Um, in the RETAIN trial, as a consequence, um, uh, the group is seeing a lot more salvage cystectomies than they anticipated. And um, it looks like the clinical trial would meet its endpoint of non-inferiority, but uh, we really had hoped that people would be able to keep their bladders. Uh, here, maybe it's a similar problem. Um, we don't know yet how heterogeneous tumors are with regard to mutations in these three genes. We would consider them to be potential likely drivers, but it hasn't really been studied the same way uh, spatial profiling is being studied with RNA expression. And maybe more importantly than that, um, there's a lot of occult disease that we're not seeing when we biopsy a primary tumor, uh, potentially contributing to uh, disease outcomes. And so, uh, it really has become a high priority subject for us to do a more deep kind of profiling of both plasma and urine, where we imagine that we'll capture a more comprehensive view of the mutational landscapes of all the primary tumors that might be present in the urothelium, as well as all the subclinical metastatic disease that's present in the periphery. So this is just the core team um, associated with 1314. There were a lot of other people involved in this. Uh, Josh has definitely gotten uh, involved in this now since uh, the original paper was published in Clinical Cancer Research um, and is working very hard on follow-up work related to molecular subtyping with Seth within the context of, of uh, another clinical trial that's being developed by SWOG. Um, I would say for our group, Woon Young Choi has really taken over all of the molecular subtyping work, and my own uh, interests have uh, shifted more to uh, understanding this molecular plasticity and how it potentially might be involved in invasion of metastasis. Uh, as far as um, you know, therapies are concerned, um, we're really interested in uh, developing more intravesical approaches that. Uh, modulate either the immune system or uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. So uh, stay tuned, and um, I think that over the course of the next year or two, uh, we're going to see this whole story change, and uh, hopefully it will change in a way that provides us with more uh, molecular biomarkers to, to help our patients. I think we'll also probably see a change in the therapeutic landscape, and uh, we will see less utilization of neoadjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy. Thanks for your attention. Hi, uh, David. It's Ted Schaefer. How are hey, you Hey, Ted. Doing? Great. Was, Miss you. Uh, awesome presentation and super inspirational for people who study other cancers. Um, you know, the bladder groups have really done a lot of great stuff. I, I have a question for you. Um, so I really liked your analogy of, you know, DNA versus RNA and plasticity and so forth. Um, I had to jump on a little bit late, but I think that there was one, there was one uh, super hardwired um, component of these tumors that you did not mention. I love a comment from you on it, and that is 
people who are 46 XX versus people who are 46 XY. <laughs> That's ultra hardwired and did not, as far as I can recall, discriminate between the, the, that particular chromosomal difference. And how does that fit into the context of this, you know, evolving schema of, uh, of different molecular subtypes? Boy, I wish we knew. So uh, there are clues associated with chromosome modifying enzyme mutations that uh, Maggie Knowles originally identified in low-grade tumors. Uh, but uh, this, this has been a question all along. Uh, we, we do see some uh, patterns with immune infiltration and uh, tertiary lymphoid structures and other things that might be associated with uh, disease progression. It may be that women get fewer bladder cancers because they got a more robust immune response to begin with. Uh, but uh, once the tumors overcome that immune surveillance, then they might become more aggressive. But at this point, Ted, it's all hand waving. We don't understand why. Uh, 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 yeah, at this, what with if you would just do a meta analysis of all the molecular work done in bladder. How many total cases do you think have been profiled, and how many of those cases are from women? Oof. Uh, again. Josh, uh, do you know, or do you, I mean, you, uh, either of you guys know? Have a ballpark idea? Just curious. Go ahead, Josh. Take a whack at that. No, I, I think it fits the, the typical 15 to 20%. Like, TCGA is probably the biggest assembled homogeneous cohort of former patients. <clears throat> And so, and, and again, they're all muscle invasive. I, I think there's trends, right? There's more trends called basal tumors, but no mutation data that really separates them. So, um, I agree. I think uh, Foundation Medicine has a huge data set mm -hmm. that we've leveraged, but even there, it's not really powered well enough. I would say Tempest might be a place where we could look toward the in the future. Um, if anybody's going to figure out if there's an association, I think it would be they first. You know, Josh and I are both talking to them, but um, I haven't heard anything about this. It's a great question. Can, can I ask you, you're, you know, you're at Hopkins and you get to, I know that you're able to attend a lot of other fields and kind of steal from them and are able to look at what they're doing. On one hand, I get the sense that the breast cancer folks have taken subtyping and it does define adjuvant therapy for them, right? People get hormonal therapy or chemo or checkpoint, and there's very little argument in their field about how that works. Alternatively, I'd say like lung is very driven by mutational data and there's almost no RNA signatures there. It seems like we're hearing what you're saying. We're kind of in the middle, and there's a debate. And probably the best data, like you say, is that the RCC2 data. But you know, if a patient, no patients really ever ask me. Maybe one, if they're ERCC2 positive and they get chemo, can they keep their bladder? Like so, that it's not even really. We're so far from that being a an integral biomarker. Why do you think that there are there are there cultural differences between tumor types or those biologic differences? Do you have any insight, David? On what I think it's biological. Are? So, uh, as as interesting as the breast cancer subtypes are, uh, they were already uh, really kind of associated with phenotypes that have been defined by ERPR or two, right? So, uh, breast cancer is like prostate cancer; it's driven by hormones, and so the uh, tightness of that link between estrogen receptor and breast cancer, luminal phenotype is a lot tighter than what we see with luminal phenotypes in bladder. Uh, as you know, I think the luminal phenotype in bladder is probably regulated by PPAR gamma, its partners, and we don't have a great sense of uh, what's regulating PPAR gamma at this point. But um, so Bogdan Cherniak thinks the plasticity issue is going to pass. It's a uh, he thinks it's all hype. Uh, I think it's it's real, and I think that um, we're also seeing this in in small cell lung cancers and and maybe neuroendocrine prostate cancers, where we we can see these molecular subtypes associated with transcriptional profiles, and we can also see evidence now emerging that they they're plastic. So 
I think it's receptors. I think it's hormone receptors that probably makes breast cancer more stable than than other uh, disease and other solid tumors. What surprises me, Josh, is that infiltration with immune cells still seems to be a robust biomarker. And if anything, I'd say I'd, I'd bet more on our stromal fibroblasts than I would on basal versus luminal. And uh, that just is crazy because you know, talk about an unstable phenotype. You can have cells coming in and out of the tumor uh, by a variety of different mechanisms. But, if I, but from what we see, I think those uh, stromal phenotypes are probably better biomarkers than basal luminal if you're assigning patients to various therapies. Yeah, I would guess that, you know, the stromal thing would be more stable and less plastic. And yeah, you know, the immune-traded breast tumors are like all lymphocytes, right? Like if you look at h and on them, it's kind of insane how skewed it is. So I, I agree. I think it's a little bit more subtle when you're talking about these other tumors and how, what that actually means, you know? At least yeah, that's my sense of I totally agree, Ted. And uh, with the Shen Group stuff... Um, they take these organoids out, they get basal, and they stick them back in the mouse, and they get back luminal again. And uh, Jenny Southgate has done this with um, PPAR gamma agonists and EGF receptor inhibitors using normal urothelial explants. Uh, she can take them, and they start out squamous, and she puts these compounds on them, and they become more luminal-looking and, and urothelial again. So I think that the plasticity is possibly an opportunity for us. Um, I think that, uh, likewise, I think the same thing is true in small cell cancers. I think that understanding this transcriptional plasticity might allow us to, to do things, to lock things in a certain state, but it seems a lot simpler at this point to base therapy either on uh, the other stromal cell uh, patterns that we see. Uh, but, you know, Josh uh, is well aware of this. This basal squamous subtype still seems to be associated with response to immunotherapy. So indirectly, basal squamous and luminal papillary seem to be maybe more robust for immune therapy outcomes because they are so tightly associated with uh, immune infiltration and other features. Well, the, plasticity, the plasticity may vary based on the original subtype of the tumor too, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's going to be um, interesting to try to push luminal papillary tumors to be more immune infiltrated, and there's a lot of efforts to do that with FGF receptor inhibitors and other approaches. I think the basal squamous tumors, uh, one of the concerns people have is with uh, stromal fibroblasts, and so there's a lot of interest in targeting TGF-beta or uh, stromal fibroblasts themselves using FAP and other approaches. So. David, uh, this is Bill Catalona. Hi. Uh, in, hi. Uh, in great lecture. Um, in um, in any of your studies, have you um, stratified patients by uh, smokers versus non-smokers? We have. Uh, that was what we really uh, wanted to see a pattern right out of the the gate. We we didn't see anything. We still haven't really linked smoking to a specific RNA expression or mutational profile. I don't know if Josh has any opinions about that. The closest we can get is with ERCC2 and single base substitution mm -hmm. 5. But uh, the smoking effect, uh, several of our colleagues are wondering whether a lot of these chemicals that get into the bladder and possibly uh, damage things work directly or through inflammation. And I think that uh, my bet is on the latter. I think that they stir up things in uh, inflammatory cells in the urothelium. And so I think once we focus more on how nitrosamines and other environmental contaminants stir things up differently, I think we'll start to see some patterns. We're also interested, of course, in a lot of other stuff like, you know, uh, heavy metals, uh, solvents, and even things like plastics have been uh, become very uh, big concerns for at least our patients. So uh, there's a resurgence in interest in, in kind of carcinogenesis and environmental uh, toxicology within our program. 
our, our beacon session was really well attended for that. So I, I think I agree with you. It, you know, it's a little different than long, right? So long, the more num the more pack years result in a greater TMB, and and we don't see that in bladder, right? So there's not a direct correlation between the pack years and mutation burden. And then you know it, you're right. It seems that smokers tend to have this signature five, and non-smokers are more apobec. And so I think you know that those are big different. I agree with you that it, that's indirect evidence that it's it's not it's not you know whatever smoking is doing it's not a direct correlation. Yeah, I don't think it's creating direct adducts, but it's it's doing something we think with signature signature five prominence um, to DNA damage, uh, but it also I think does something to to irritate the urethelium and cause some inflammation. Uh, it, it's it's not that satisfying to bring back the same general concepts over and over again, but boy, I tell you, inflammation probably really does set the stage for cancer in every uh, solid organ. So, great. Yeah, and J Josh is a rock star. Um, it's great working with him. You're gonna have to do what you can to to keep him. He's he's really fantastic. Well, thanks for doing this, David. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's great talk. So yeah, thanks. Fine with us on a Thursday night. Great seeing you, and uh, see you again soon at SWOG.